everybody, and welcome to the News Pace Podcast. I'm Johnny Vedmore. I'm here today with someone who I consider a friend, so this is going to be quite fun, and it's going to be a, a, a brilliant conversation. Um, we're going to probably go down a couple of rabbit holes here and a couple of rabbit holes here. Um, this is with Ed the Techie. You'll find him on Twitter, get or whatever, you know, as Ed the Techie. And I first met him as 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 a meme, a high quality meme enthusiast, I would say. Uh and and general techie, general generally a nice guy. He was doing lots of memes around the place and they were really clever stuff, and I was really enjoying it. And then we started talking, and before you knew it, we were just backwards and forwards, and then came in the Twitter crunch, the thing where everybody got crushed on Twitter for a short amount of time, where suddenly all your friends disappeared, <laughs> your network of people just vanished all of a sudden. And and Ed the Techie was one of those. And there was two people um, that I was calling for reinstatement through the entirety of that time. And one was Ed the Techie, and the other was um was Jinx because Jinx is naughty and I do like him too. Um, and both came back eventually and uh, it's it's progressed. I've been so lucky to go and meet Ed and, and hang out with him properly um, and get invited into his life in some, uh, to some uh, extent. So this is Ed. He's from Brighton. He knows a lot about this and a lot about that. Little bits about this, little bits about that. And he's going to tell us all about it. Ed, how are you doing today? I'm very good, Johnny. Thank you. And thank you very much for that really nice introduction. I consider you a friend as well. And it was really great hanging out with you that weekend you came down. Um, yeah. And yeah, no, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And hello, everybody. This is me. Um, people might know me, people might not. Um, yeah, there's not, not much special. I just like making memes and making people laugh. Um, making memes, making people laugh, but also, you know, treating people with a base sense of like you know honesty and understanding cutting through the stuff too that's what memes do is what art does isn't it well that's the whole point it it's uh it's it's one of the most powerful weapons we've got quite frankly um and if you think about there's a there's actually a great meme floating around about memes which is of a um a dinosaur um basically with a turtle and the turtle's just hidden away and the the, the text over the dinosaur is like trillion dollar marketing machine um and then on the little turtle it's like uh loads of little people on photoshop <laughs> <laughs> um and the humor it it cuts through so much it really does i mean you, you you can't you can't be afraid of something if you're too busy laughing at it and you mm -hmm. can't you can't take something seriously if you're too busy laughing at it um and I mean, I exclusively focus on world leaders and people in the public eye. I, I, I very occasionally I make a meme of a friend, but I, I, I will restrict myself to to people who cartoonists and political commentators and stuff are all lampooning in the press or not lampooning enough. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm I'm kind of relentless. My current thing at the moment is replacing Rishi Sunak's head with Roland Rat, which if you know me on Twitter, you will have seen them. And every single picture that Rishi Sunak's Twitter account puts out of him that I can Photoshop, um, yeah, it gets the Roland Rat treatment. And I know I know I make quite a few people laugh, but mainly I make myself laugh, which is why I do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you with that one. I got you with that one. Um, I, I think you touch on a few things there. One thing is that, and these are very serious, because whenever you you uh, have like some form of cultural output, some sort of artistic something, it always like makes you realize how life works and the prisms that we all look through and stuff. And so it all it's all very intriguing. What is what what it links in with me at the moment and what i've been looking into is how pr and marketing basically are the filter the photo filter the filter app for nearly every single thing in our society every single thing gets its separate treatment of pr and marketing um in a way that is really uh intrusive so i i was telling someone i'll tell you this quick story i was telling someone about um how policy is made uh, a, a nice girl who strokes my cat that's not a euphemism she isn't a nice girl and she does stroke my cat outside my house i often go outside and i find her there and she's 
petting away and she's enjoying herself. And I think she may be a little bit on the spectrum, to be honest. Um, and I said to her uh, something and she replied something back and mentioned 20 mile per hour speed limits. And I was like, basically the same policy institutes make the, these policies for um, b- both parties. So it's irrelevant. And she said, no, that's not true. That's not true. And I and I said, no, no, it's just like policy institutes make policy and then uh, they sell it to political parties who then sell it to you know, to the people to get into government and then they implement it into a legal framework and that's how it works. Policy institute first, then politicians. Politicians don't actually come up with policy. Policy institutes do. And she ran off down the street. I mean, really ran off down the street. But then I got to thinking why that was so scary. And you take away what you're doing specifically is you're taking away the filter of PR and marketing. You reverse it. Um, and that is a filter that is on everything. You can't get the policy institute doesn't get to, to its policy across if it doesn't market it and PR it well enough and it doesn't get to government and then it doesn't get into a legal framework and so on. And if we can find ways to do what you're doing in one section and we reverse PR and marketing, I think that's what I see in what you're doing. It's like reverse PR. I think that's what largely what memes are actually, Johnny. I, I think that it's, um, but I think they're born out of out of a sense of frustration, and you try and put into words what that frustration is, or you try and you try and express the frustration. And I mean, I tend not to use a lot of words on my memes. I like the pictures to stand for them on their own, because it gives people the opportunity to create their own words about them um and also it has the other benefit of not being you can't ocr it so you can't have a computer scan it and read words and then use those to filter it or censor it or whatever um i'm also i should say how long just quickly just remember that last bit how long do you think they'll be able to scan the picture and and know what what the picture means well they they the thing is that it's easy enough for them to scan the picture but when if they scanned one of my my roland memes all they would scan is is a picture with a roland rat face so they might be able to identify the fact that it's got roland rat in it but the machine wouldn't necessarily be able to distinguish between one of my memes and a screenshot from a roland rat tv series for example and just for the record so that people know i'm not a labor party supporter um, I replace Keir Starmer's head with Beaker, which is my new thing. And, yeah, and, I like it. Um, <laughs> and and that will be, it took me a while. I had to go through different ones. I tried him as Sooty. I tried him as a Womble. I tried, I tried all sorts yeah. of different heads for Keir Starmer. And then it wasn't my idea, actually. Someone online, I can't remember who it was on Twitter, um, made the suggestion. And I just thought, yeah, with that red hair, it, it's just so, it's so him. And he's, yeah, he's a dark one. Yeah, ultimate muppet, ultimate muppet. I'm, I'm, I really want to go into um, a uh, 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 next year. I am going into a lot of the Labour Party. Now, I know you're not. Um, you say you're not Labour Party, so this interests me a little bit because, what do you consider? Do you consider yourself on the current political spectrum at all, or you are you like me? Are you kind of like? everybody's a bloody loon <laughs> and they can't they're selling you bollocks all over the place which one are you going with i i'm 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 like you i mean i'm i'm politically homeless before mm. before covid happened and before all of the all of the nonsense with um all of this this right wing label that the certain sections of society like to throw around at people like like me i'm if you actually looked at what i how I think society should be organized. Um, I'm go on, my friend. How would you like it to be organized? Well, no, but I'm. I'm. I'm <laughs> I mean, I'm. I would probably be re- relatively centrist because there's certain views that I've got. I mean, for example, I'm. I, I think that every country should have a second amendment to start with. Um, and I'm in favor of capital punishment, but I'm not in favor of corrupt courts and so as long as there's a possibility that an innocent person is going to be um executed i don't think that we've got in any business executing people and i don't think there's any such thing mm. as a completely fair 
justice system. But mm. whereas I was considered myself more probably more left of center because I do believe in things like social safety nets and stuff like that. But now I'm a right wing extremist. Yeah, I know. Um, me too. And, <laughs> My and dad that, was a steel worker. And now yeah. I'm a uh, Lenin or something. Oh no, not the opposite. Sorry, I'm I'm Hitler. No, he was even a bit left wing. Uh, who was right on the Who was on the right? I don't know. All of the dictators were on the left, weren't they? Well, I mean, this is the bizarre thing about someone like Hitler because I mean, it was Mussolini who co- who coined the term fascism, and and M- Mussolini said that fascism is a merger of corporate and state power, and. Uh, so he was right. They call Hit- the capitalism. Sorry, yeah, but on. but then but then if you look at someone like um, Hitler, he was. I mean, people would describe him as a fascist, but he was actually much more left. I mean, it was the National mm. Socialist Party, um, and 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 so he was. I mean, he, he was not. He wasn't communist, but he wasn't that sort of left. But all of these labels and all of this right and left, it, it winds me up because. I'm. I think that it's just uniparty. It's two cheeks of the same backside, and mm-hmm. I mean, you, I. It irritates me when people who are supposedly call themselves awake, um, sit there talking about leftists and rightists and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and I'm like, well, you've obviously clearly got a bit more waking up to do. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. The- I mean, Marx was Marx was funded by a lot of the same people that funded people like Adam Smith, and I mean, the whole Marxist ideology is is just ah, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, it wasn't even well written for crying out loud. I don't know if anyone's tried to listening has it, tried to actually read Das Kapital. Oh my God! I, I you but, know, <laughs> I, can I just I keep what you got in mind there? But I decided, I decided, I try and read it. Uh, this was probably about 2017, 2018, when I was still being called a communist a lot. Uh, <laughs> and, and then, and then I, I like, I had a real hard time reading it because it's so badly written. So I ended up going, okay, I was working nights in a hotel. I'll just listen to the audio book over and over again. So every night for a week, I kept trying to listen to the audio book. And it was just a guy going, and look at you, you're all of my enemies. Ha ha ha, I'm going to create something thing and yours is bad and mine is good and that was basically it i just seemed to be fundamentally a really uh immature man being gloating about how good he is and how clever he is and how good his system is while like knowing what his system actually has done over the years just it it makes you feel sick it makes you just yeah. not attached to based in any reality like but then if you look at a lot of that, I mean, the, the communist ideology, all of none of that is based in reality either. It's mm-hmm. all, I mean, it, they don't take into account the way that economic systems work. And I'm not necessarily in favor of just allowing the market to do everything because corporations are, are, are psychopaths. I mean, this has been established by all sorts of different psychology studies and everything else that the people, psychopaths, either become mass murderers or they go into business. Um, And it's so you can't just have unfettered capitalism. But what Marx was proposing is like fairy dreamland. And what what he actually created, what they ended up creating with it is more tyranny, more autocracy, more, more of the enslavement. I mean, there's a, I like voluntarism. Which is the which is the new the new name that anarchists are are calling what they believe in mm-hmm. that because you, you can have um, you don't need you don't need it, it's not about no rules it's about no rulers mm-hmm. um, and actually if you go on the basis that human societies are self organizing then you can't have mayhem but there has to be I mean, there there have to be some political philosophers out there that aren't on the right and aren't on the left and have some good ideas. But people like that never get heard because the way that academia works and the way that the modern world works is you have to be on board with whatever the current narrative is. What's the problem? Hang on. 
I was going to say, what's bothered me, like when I think about Soviet Union and you think about all of the foibles and mistakes that that were were present within the Soviet Union, you got like warehouses full of the same size shoes that no one's going to wear, yeah, and other other things like that. And I think that was just really representative of people. And again, <clears throat> you've just brought up something very interesting where you said. Uh, has anybody actually read Das Kapital or any of Marx's uh, like work? Have you uh, like once you actually read it, you realize that it's not easy to implement or understand that a lot of it is just like blue versus red or just, you know, one team <laughs> versus the other. So it's just a, a, a nonsense at the end of it, combative nonsense. And that, that the reason why there was all these warehouses full of these things that no one was going to use was quite simply that everybody pretends to understand it. So it says, yes, we're going to enact it. And then they're just waiting for the other person to enact it so that they, they could just follow the lead. But no one's taking the lead because no one knows what's going on. And that's what it turned into. It turned into... If you question the fact the state of hypernormalization that occurs from that, then you get sent to the gulags, and that's yeah. basically it. Yeah, absolutely. And and anyone, if if you look at all of the great advancements in human technology and human thought and art and everything else, they all came from the periphery. They all came from the mavericks. They all came from the people who were called crazy until they were called geniuses. Um, the the radical ideas are never accepted immediately. And what we have now with all of the scientific papers, I mean, it's like not many people know that a company, a Dutch company called Elsevier Publications owns almost all of the scientific journals. Um, and and it's you, you have these gatekeepers. It's like you have Google that owns search results. You have Facebook that owns... Um, whatever the hell's Facebook owns it, it's Facebook seems to, seems to be less and less, it seems to be less point in it by each passing day. I mean, it's basically where I go to remember birthdays. Um, so that I'm usually <laughs> so that I don't get in trouble with my mother for forgetting someone's birthday, but all of my friends and family know I'm used to it anyway, but yeah, I forget all birthdays standards. So there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry to everybody involved. <laughs> um, and I mean, and, and you, do you have these, I was just talking to a, a friend um, on the phone early this afternoon and she has kids um, and she was saying how her kids all, all want to be U YouTube influencers or YouTubers. How is a YouTuber a profession? Surely, uh, surely you have to, you have to have a profession yeah. which you then YouTube about. I mean, you can't, you, you can't just YouTube my boring little life without, I mean, you I understand it, though. I understand it. I've mm -hmm. been there. I've been there wanting to do something and not realizing that you've got to find something to do before you can do the something, you know? Uh, yeah. You actually have to find... Uh, you have to get some content in that character and content for any YouTube channel you make. Now, I, I can tell you that. I, uh, I, I now create a lot of content for, for YouTube and the stuff. And I just, like, record everything, basically. <laughs> That's what I do. I go recording everything and that's being a youtuber in a sense you just got to go out and do stuff all of the time and the thing is about the kids is that they're not they they want to do all of this but they're going to hang around on benches and smoke weed like we used mm. to do <laughs> well they i mean they, they talk to each other in video games they, yeah, i mean yeah. this 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 same friend of mine was saying that her that when she sees her son and he comes over and he's literally just playing with his his mate on on a computer game or something and, and the kid lives just down the road <laughs> and these yeah. kids have instead of actually interacting and and it's it's oh, having man. a really bad effect on society i mean all yeah. of the so much of this cancel culture woke narrative nonsense is just people being dragged along and and you just it's like they, they don't want to think for themselves. And so the people doing the thinking for them want them to move like a nice herd of sheep into a particular direction. Mm -hmm. And they have these sheepdogs, which is like Mariana Spring, for example, 
She's a she's a good sheepdog. <laughs> oh, Mariana, my beautiful, yeah, the, the the little poodle face you gave her, a little poodle <laughs> look you gave her, sorry, body is amazing. She she just looks perfect. She just so she's, beautiful. Yeah, she's just so. Um, she's she'll so come memorable. after me eventually. You know, she her or, or her the, the one who follows her. They're gonna have to come after me. The BBC, me and the BBC have already had multiple behind the scenes, backwards and forwards about different things, and I've never agreed to work with them, and always said that I don't trust them at all, and being like, and they've always been trying to get in somewhere because they can't write a story about me. Because if they write a story about me, then everybody will find out about my work and that's a no-no <laughs> so it's gonna be like it, 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 at least with russell brand if uh if they they uh, like do a piece on him then everybody will look at him wanking off a homeless guy in the toilet or peeing himself in public and they'll go oh yeah that confirms that he's a wanker you know with with, with me it's like they have to come to terms with the fact that schwab's dad helped me like the nazis try and gain the atomic bomb and that's a little bit more awkward and precarious yeah. You don't. Yeah. They, they can't have any truth bombs. I I, lo- I but I love this. I love that that we have to have these battles because I take the I I'm that means I have free reign to have a go at the BBC. Mm. It means that I I can do <laughs> I can I can have a go at them and they shouldn't be able to have a go back because they they're constrained by their own like evil sort of ways. But yeah. that'll only last so long. Eventually, they come after everybody and and I think. One of the the signs, the, like the woke culture stuff, part of it is like the breakdown of the mainstream media. I Means the mainstream media is pumping out this sort of stuff. And another thing, I you know, oh, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, um, and I've been looking and studying. And I said it in a news pasty the other day, in one of the last ones that was out. You know, traditional values in the east of Europe and Russia has always been a massive thing. You know, traditional Christian values. If you're from Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, uh, any of those sort of areas and beyond, then you agree with, probably agree with traditional Christian values and you want to keep things in that way. Woke culture is something else and it's trying to, it's just not going to work over there. It's just going to cause a divide and it doesn't even work over here. So it doesn't even make any sense because it just becomes with a load of people. It's it's got to be to destabilize your own population to cause problems. Um, you go on. No, I was just going to say everything they're doing is about destabilizing it. From from the they're they're trying to destabilize people's minds with with the constant fear narrative and the propaganda and jumping from one issue to the next and everyone's confused about. I mean, they've even got people confused about what's a man and what's a woman. They have people confused about social interactions where you you have to somehow to be a polite person you have to think about what some person's pronouns are mm-hmm. and 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 you have to you have to twist language around by referring to an individual person as they or them which is what you call more than one person and and it's and every every one of these interest groups has to be the most important i mean there was i'm not sure if you saw in the week there was one of these um large people influencers i don't know what the the politically correct term for them is who'd set out a list of demands to airlines so that 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 people that were too fat felt more felt, felt more included by giving them free seats and all of this free stuff and and it's just it's just created this society of narcissistic mm-hmm. unpleasant people mm-hmm. No, it has. It's de- it's created um, a load of people who are basically going to um, continue to try and put their agenda forward until basically they get crushed. And this is, uh, I mean, it's really easy to send a vanguard that's completely and utterly useless, so that everybody's watching that vanguard for before the, the actual battle uh, commences, and you get your real uh, fighters involved. And this is, I, I, 
I feel I feel s- somewhat sorry for a lot of people who've been caught up in this. Um, I feel that there's a lot of genteel characters. I mean, I mean, gender itself is a, is a complicated thing. Understanding how a, a feminine s- a scale of uh, a spectrum of man can be and how masculine the spectrum of of woman can be is just like it's mind boggling. I've met people who completely go against all gender norms in every different type of way so there's like so many elements of it where i'm completely sympathetic with loads of different things it's just this standard unbreakable things you just you know women's safe spaces um the ability to suddenly like change reality as we know it just not only logical philosophical sort of things but actual physical reality to suddenly start naming things that aren't something else those Mm. things are gonna those things are the true problem that's what our society is sick with definitions yeah it's no i agree with you 100 percent. it's so orwellian i can't believe we have generations and generations of people that have read all well and learned absolutely nothing whatsoever (laughs) And then you've got another section that decided to turn uh, Brave New World 1984 into um, training manuals. Um, and I agree with you. The thing that the thing that really disturbs me about, particularly the trans agenda, is that they 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 do the opposite of what they say. They they say be kind, and then they do really unpleasant mm. things to anyone who disagrees with them. And I think, for example, and I, I agree with you about having sympathy for for kids. I mean, trying to grow up as a teenager, I, I found it difficult enough um, back in the 80s and, and 90s when I, was, when I went through my teenage period. And that was hard enough. I can't even imagine doing it with social media and all of the nonsense that they've got now. And, and also all of the teacher training manuals that are supposedly affirming people and i think it's good to i mean it, it it's good to affirm someone but you don't it's like if someone if a if a young if a young girl comes to comes to you and says and expresses an issue about being female surely the the, the correct approach is to to try and listen to them and understand what it is about themselves that they're so unhappy with that that they feel like they're born into the wrong body instead of saying right well we can we can attach a couple of bits and we can give you some pills and yeah we don't really know what those pills are going to do long term because we haven't really tested it but um we can we can help you out it's crazy i know what makes me cringe there as soon as you say oh you know we can cut things and we can uh, it's the medical intervention part <laughs> that's that's the point where it's like wow okay yeah you, you that, that, we're stepping over boundaries that lead to extremely bad places and when you're saying the brave new world uh, <laughs> as as a training manual or as a guide um you know i did the work on herman khan and and the the year 2000 and basically they're mapping out all the technologies that were going to come in the future and then instead of being like Herman Kahn was saying hey slow down we're going to create we're going to we're going to come up to fundamentally the hardest point in human civilization that could end in us dying extremely easy don't go into it quickly and it's just become a training uh, guide of it's just become a tick sheet it's just become a checklist to get to transhumanism for for a load of people who uh, 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 I want to say tropic, tropical, you know, <laughs> tropical. Mm. Uh, um, uh, they, they, they're, they're stuck in this, this, this uh, belief that they're going to um, be able to live forever and be able to do all of these things, and it's just such a human experience. Um, okay, I gotta ask quite. We, we gotta because 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 that. I mean, that's good talking. Good talking, but we—I we, mean—we're going to talk about a couple of subjects today. And I think I'd mm-hmm. like, 
I, I, I'd like uh, for other people as well, because you're saying, you know, you grew up in the 80s and 90s, so you've ba- basically seen a, you're a bit older, a bit older than me, so you've seen basically the same sort of things, but just a little bit advanced on. So when did the whole thing start to, like, were you, were you, sh- were you, like I was when you were young, get, getting fed um, BBC and believing it to, to as most of the extent? And did you come out of that paradigm? When did you get to the point that you are now? When was the breaking point? Um, well, I've, I've always, I, I was brought up in Africa until I was 11, which shaped my younger years very much. And for us, we had the BBC World Service, which back in the day, the... And even my my father used to admit this that the B, the World Service's news about the UK itself was mostly just propaganda, government garbage, but their news internationally was always really good. Um, and I'm sure that there was still it was it was in it was when there was the kind of people like John Pilger in terms of we're talking journalists that would actually go out to the war zone. I mean, you look at some of the um, some of the really significant correspondence from the vietnam war i mean pilger is a good example because he's still he's still going and i don't i don't necessarily agree with everything he says um particularly since the whole covid thing but i respect his i respect his journalistic integrity in the same way that i respect your journalistic integrity um and the research and actually trying to find some sort of semblance about what's actually going on and not just kowtowing to um, like moneyed interests and all of the assorted douchebags that are trying to control the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so you wanted to you wanted to start off. Well, the thing with I've been I've seen it go from um, being able to smoke on airplanes and being in Zambian airport security with um, with a security guard rifling through suitcases. Um, I remember because we used to fly after my parents split up, we'd fly out to Zambia every year to see my dad. And there was one year that um, a UTA flight exploded over the Sahara. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and we, we actually flew UTA. We were on that. I th- I'm not sure if it was that exact route, but we, we'd basically fly from um, Paris to uh, usually somewhere like Cameroon or one of the the West African colonies, and then from down there down to Zambia, um, and the plane would then go on to Malawi as well. And yeah, so we've uh, we've done all sorts. I mean, we got to Zambia one year, and there was a um, riots, and there was a curfew, and my dad had to hustle us out of the airport really quickly. So back wow, then, yeah. the, the, I mean, my dad. Always what year used... was this? Or what what year around was this? Do you oh, know? Do you that remember? was that was the. It would have been about it was the it was the late 80s it mm-hmm. would have been about it's, it's a lot of stories from africa during this period that i've mm-hmm. got from different people like over the 10 year period is like getting out of the country when everything's falling apart you know in different countries the same i've got stories of gabon and stuff um i mean the, the, these these places were relatively unstable then and probably it's, haven't changed too much today well so zambia on, itself is no it's fine i mean zambia we lived in Nigeria and Malawi as well, but Zambia is the bit that I remember the most. And we we were actually incredibly lucky because Zambia is one of the most peaceful, stable countries in Africa. They've never, mm. um, even their even their war for independence is uh, it's more of a really large protest than necessarily yeah. a war. I mean, there was a lot of I don't I don't want to to belittle anything that happened or any of the freedom fighters or people like Kaunda and stuff. Um, and I actually met Kenneth Kaunda once or twice because of my dad which uh, I, I, it was fascinating. But, I mean, Africa is it's, it's an unbelievably fascinating place. Um, but the other thing that I've seen is is the birth of the internet as well, because I've been working on the, work, the web pretty much since there was a web. I mean, it was, it was the early 90s that Tim Berners-Lee created uh, Hypertext. Um, yeah, announced H- it on Usenet in 1991. Yeah, and it was 19, 1995 that I first started working on the internet. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm the original, one of the original internet dinosaurs. Well, the web, because the internet itself had been around for a lot longer. 
and the way that that's changed and the effect the impact that that's had on society is phenomenal in yeah. in i mean in so many ways but it's now it went from just being a bunch of hackers and we had an etiquette and people didn't send spam emails and stuff like that and now you just you have an email account you sign up for a few companies and boom suddenly your whole mailbox is just filled with mm-hmm. untold spam and it's completely it, it's i i sometimes wonder whether spam wasn't used as a way of um making email less important because this idea to send instant messages if there was no spam and it was just people communicating you wouldn't need i mean this is where this is why messaging platforms were invented Mm -hmm. because email itself is instant but the spam is just craziness yeah yeah Um, i i go on no no no, i was just going to say i mean i've Ah, uh, which which part of the of the last thirty forty years do you want to do you want to focus in on? Because I mean, I, I Christ, I remember watching the Berlin Wall come down. Um, and yeah, I've, yeah. I did international well, I, relations at university as well, so I've always had an interest in all of this this stuff. First, when when we go to, I I find it really interesting, like um, when the time the journalistic integrity kind of started to break apart properly in the mainstream, and when you were talking about Vietnam War and Belgium, and I'm I'm thinking about um, Max Frankel who won a Pulitzer Prize. I think in about 1970 three or 74 for um or it got to be 74 i reckon uh for nixon's visit to china and a couple of years before i think seymour hirsch had won for his coverage in vietnam and both those guys i see as uh narrative setters and part working and a uh, adopted by the establishment during that period um the uh, max frankel joined the german marshall fund and of course seymour hirsch kind of continued the essence of explaining like um the like expanded versions of mutually assured destruction and Kissinger's sort of uh, war, like limited warfare. So it kind of like continued teaching the masses about these very important things. Like I kind of think that these people are put in place and everybody, like when the Nord Stream thing happened, everybody was like, ah, oh, look, someone with journalistic integrity, like Seymour Hirsch. And that's the, exactly the person you want to have put up there at that point being someone people will believe so i'm always suspicious of nearly all pressmen nowadays of any journalist um from the off and i'm a journalist so it's it's a really bad thing to be in a really bad place to be in but i'm all automatically like got to check over who they were associated with who they were aligned with before uh because because so much so much looks like journalistic integrity but turns out to be um something else and talking about where we want to talk about because yeah i i find the the Berlin. I, I first first when you were talking about the internet, of course, I I did a lot of research on Usenet, uh, the precursor kind of to the internet, which was based in mainly in America with like universities and public institutions communicating with between each other. Now they got round the spam thing by everybody had to use their own identifier their own name their own email address from their institution that they were representing and so that means that number one there was records kept of everything that was being exchanged which is terrible for all the people involved as soon they had to destroy those databases um but it stopped spam and of course email takes away that but with you'd have to you we'd have to like be in a system where we do give our identity away if we wanted to avoid it i think i think that's the conclusion has come to yeah I'm, i mean every single because as part of my job one of the things that that i build is uh, mass email systems for clients so client can they they have a database of their members they can go to a special web page and they fill their details in press a button and it sends all that they use as an email um and trying to get those emails through to users is just gets more and more complicated every year and they've added new layers of different um 
checking systems and there's stuff that you do in a domain record and there's stuff there's like special keys called dkim which you add to emails it doesn't stop the spam but then it's also a lot of it doesn't class as spam because a lot of the what what you and i have our inboxes filled up with is actually where you've had to sign up for a particular thing demi spam yeah and pseudo, they've ended, pseudo spam yeah absolutely um and there's just too much of it and and mm. so it, this is now why when when you're on social media but if you look at facebook it's going the same way because it's just adverts and the same i mean i have a verified twitter account so i think i might see less adverts than than the not unverified users but twitter itself even even for us us um, dastardly blue ticks is it's still filled with more and more and more adverts which is what happens when you hire someone from advertising to be your ceo <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 uh mr mr freedom of speech not freedom of reach and and mr and mrs lawful but awful i mean it, it's <laughs> it's craziness and I, I mean i am grateful to to elon musk for buying twitter and reinstating my account and connecting me with all the the people out there that i'm that i'm fans of and and that i enjoy interacting with and get lots of good information from like you for example and it, it's kind of yeah but it's so arbitrary because you know that just flick of the switch and you you can be gone again the, ma the masters can be against you all of a sudden and that's what they are they're definite definite masters we have Absolutely. no control over these things and then suddenly the the, the wind changes just for a second yeah, absolutely. And I mean, they still, there are still people that are persona non grata. I mean, Tommy mm -hmm. Robinson, for example, who I had the, I had the establishment view of him as a far right, racist, scary, bigot person. And then I saw, who was it that interviewed him? I think it might have been someone like Majid Nawaz or one of these, um, one of the more well known of the, um, Influence three truthery type. I don't like the word truther. I think it's silly. But yeah. um, those those on those on this side of the fence who who like to think for themselves and do their own research. Um, and I came away with a completely different view of the man. He 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 came across as extremely reasonable, extremely nice, extremely like a the sort of person that you think, yeah, that's a good dad that takes care of his family. Which yeah. I'm I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a father. Um, and I don't, I don't even have a wife. I just had succession of bad relationships. <laughs> um, but that's, I'm not going to go into that one, but it's still, What's I that? have respect. Like, you can hear a choir. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but on, I mean, sorry. I have, I have respect for, for the husbands and the fathers out there mm -hmm. who are providing for their families and doing the best for their kids, doing the best for their wives. And um, I have masses of respect for that. And, and it's, some things are important. Some things aren't. And, the society that we live in is sending things in completely the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what you going back to what you were saying earlier about the whole trans agenda and how we're, we're having to invert so much and, and twist things around to make it make sense. And it's all being done deliberately. It, it's, and, and they're using that distraction and in the background um, to quote, um, the war of the world say they, they're letting their plans against us mm -hmm. and slowly yeah. but surely they 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 made their plans against us that that famous quote and it's yeah and then it's, it's like one of the reasons i like the stuff that you do is because you go properly deep into subjects i mean i'm good at skirting over things because i don't have a huge amount of time to divert, devote to lots of in-depth research um, and I'm also, I get bored quite quickly. So I, I like to go from topic to topic and I like knowing a bit about a lot of different things. Um, but reading some of the stuff that you've produced over the years, um, I've learned masses and masses and masses of detail. And I like the, the way that you go into um, family trees and genealogies. We had this conversation when, when we hooked up here. Um, because when you actually look back on if you, you go back through someone's family, that's where you see their influences come from and the sorts of people they are. If you have a, if you have a family of chefs, like um, 
Neapolitan pizza chefs, for example. There's a <laughs> there's a there's a place not too far from mine that does the most fabulous proper proper Italian pizzas, and it's a family from Napoli, and they it's like it goes back generations of them all making pizza, and they're all happy, and they they. I mean that's very different from someone like Bill Gates, <laughs> who's yeah, just yeah. this go this this long line of um, eugenicist, megalo- megalomaniacal, um, autocratic, greedy, rich wannabe tyrants. I mean, <laughs> in in control of their arena, their family, their area, um, and and trying to push their influence and their agenda upon everyone else since. 1370 something you know that's it's i i've i've started to realize that i went past being like a conspiracy theory writer or anything like that or a conspiracy theorist all this and i went into the the realms of historian and then i stayed around in the realms of historian for quite a while um and and it it, it makes it really awkward it makes it really awkward because the truth is um the truth is really if you want to know everything that happened in history it's going to take you your entire life if you know certain things you see where the joins are and ever for the rest of the illusion falls away so that's what we, we're all got to be doing that's what you're doing as well as what i'm doing as what a lot of people out there and i agree with the, the problem with the using the term truther I, I used it today i was talking to someone um uh, about uh, 9-11 and we were having this conversation um, and he actually doesn't believe in the official narrative um, yet still sees uh, the question of official narrative as conspiracy theory but if you already know a conspiracy exists you're just not sure which conspiracy it is it doesn't make any um, sense getting back to uh one because because god we, we that's there's a there's a lot i, I like this conversation yeah and that's good a lot to, um i like going from topic to topic yeah and it all seems to 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 link up so you were saying you know how far you can go back because because uh, i mean for for me when i was watching david hasselhoff performing in in uh berlin and and there being all the celebrations you know i was pretty young when I was watching uh, the first Iraq war and stuff, I was I was pretty young. Um, and all of that time, I believed what was be going on. Rwanda, I believed. Bosnia, I believed. I believed whatever the BBC had fed me and, and establishment reporters. And it was probably uh, September the 11th that, that broke me out of that. Were you out of it before September the 11th? Um, I well, I've been fascinated by geopolitics, particularly political assassinations, ever since Indira Gandhi's murder. Not that I was a researcher, and I did believe the official explanations. And I think um, when I when I also when I first watched um, watched Oliver Stone's JFK movie, um, those those sort those sorts of things kind of softened my mind up enough. That when 9-11 happened, mm-hmm. that was when I I still remember very distinctly, not just what was happening on 9-11, but I still have a very clear memory of, of how it was a Friday afternoon at work and it was about four o'clock and I'd done everything for the week. I basically had an hour of time that I didn't I didn't have to didn't have anything to do. So and it had been bugging at me and I sat down and I typed into I can't remember what search engine it was. Was it Google? I think it. I think it was. It was primitive Google back then. In fact, I think that was just when it was starting, um, and it was the most impressive search engine that I'd I'd ever used up until that mm. point. And I literally used all of them. I can um, just a small tangent. I mean, right the, the right the very first ver- the very first version of Yahoo. I used that, um, and. I typed what really happened on 9-11 into a search engine and I found a website called whatreallyhappened.com, which is probably not the same result that you'll get for a search like that today. Um, and to plug Mike Rivero, whatreallyhappened.com, it, it's a, he's a great aggregator. I mean, he has his own views, but he's good at pulling in 
lots of different news sources from um local places it's like if he's if he's reporting on something that's happening in say israel like at the moment he will be pasting in links to ynet news and al jazeera and news sources that are actually in the area so you can get a, a you can, it, it's a great site for getting alternative views about stuff but also what's happening what people are saying on the ground um which i think you just need to as you know you need to be constantly trying to look at all of the information sources that you've got and is this can i confirm this is anyone else saying this does this feel right does this track with my previous experience does this seem like it if i was a detective i'd say who who benefits from this um and all these different techniques that we all have to use constantly to try and figure out what the hell's going on in this world and to try and um to try and make sense of it which is basically where my research started with with 911 so yeah i'd say 911 but my i i like to think I always take it back to JFK because the, the, the Kennedy assassination is something that, like I said, political assassinations, Kennedy, Indira Gandhi, um, and far too many others. We could just sit here for an hour reeling off the list. But it's also interesting when you go back over events like that and you look at the rabbit holes surrounding the assassination of Indira Gandhi, and then you also factor in what 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 about? Well, the I don't know state? much about I don't know much about the assassination of Indira Gandhi, and I probably should because I've skirted by the, that subject over and over again. But I've never looked for because because I, I mean uh, she she came up in uh, Pottinger. Um, uh, it's supporting her supremacy with Gloria Stein and befriending her when she was a young CIA recruit, just recruited straight out of I India. Um, uh, and uh, like, oh, I just met her, I just happened to meet her. So there's obviously they're getting the the agency in there straight away. So, so you, you know, um, th that's not something that I know much about. So. Well, there's I, connections. I, I mean, I'm I I don't know a massive amount about it. I remember, well, I I remember being probably about seven or eight and being absolutely fascinated to hear that this important Indian lady had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was probably the very first time I'd ever heard the word assassinate. It's kind of a mm -hmm. cool word as well when you're a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then my dad was really into Time magazine, um, which obviously we it's not. I wouldn't describe as a reliable source of information now. No, I'd describe it as super gay. <laughs> but anyway, go on. <laughs> I'm a relic, so who knows? No, I yeah, I no, I I agree. But they they they'd done this infographic of of this whole area around where she was murdered, and I'm sure that there was more to it than that. And there was absolutely no alternative information in this article. I just remember as as a child being fascinated by this whole notion that someone would get would get killed for um being having a different opinion to it was just it was really it was a formative little moment for me um and then finding out about kennedy and oliver stone's really i mean you, amazing that that's a, one of the I, I mean it, it shook me when i was young as well just left yeah me. i watched it over and over again and it's a long bloody film well it's like three and a half hours or something it's like almost seven samurai sort of level i don't know i can't remember yeah and it's uh, and and i've again i mean i've got it uh, I've, I still have it, and I still go back and watch it. And I'm yeah, not sure if yeah, you watched the yeah. update. It's making me wanna. It's making me. What do you mean? Uh, it's it an update. <laughs> yeah, no, he did a. He did a. Uh, uh, let me just pull this. Let me just find in my browser, and I'll pull it up for you. Um, he did a. It wasn't the movie, but it was almost like a. Uh, a review, um, not a review. What's the right word for it? Um, he kind of. Hang on a minute. Let me just look. Yeah, it's called JFK Revisited, um, mm. and it was uh, 2021. Um, yeah, JFK Revisited through the Looking Glass, and and he sort of goes back to talk to some of the actors, and he he just sort of looks at aspects of the story. It's, if you're if you're a fan of the movie, you should definitely watch um, watch this. I'll I'll send you the link. 
um, mm -hmm. because it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. And and that for me was, I was just about to go into university, mm -hmm. um, and then for ages I didn't, I wasn't really that interested in the. I mean, I've I've always been interested in what's going on in the world, and I've always assumed that there's more stuff happening than we than we know about. I was a massive X Files fan. Um, and when the internet first came out, I was, I was one of the people that was out there looking for, <laughs> looking for different alternative bits of information, including the secret KFC recipe. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, that, that tickled me pink. Yes. No, that was a thing. It was, it was, it was yeah. people. And, but that was when the internet was, um, much smaller and mm -hmm. less, um, less full on certainly less pervasive i mean back then i was a, i was a computer nerd and and over the years of of over the last say 30 years i've gone from being a computer nerd to an it professional mm -hmm. um and the technology has gone from the very first web browser i used which was netscape 0.9n and it didn't support background images or tables or forms or anything like that no it could do forms but very very primitive um and you look at now i mean i've been working with uh open ai at work and doing a huge amount of ai stuff i mean my last oh my last i actually did a coding project with ai both mm -hmm. um because at the time i was actually i'd had a a late night conversation with a friend and we'd been we'd just gotten into a groove and we'd been chatting until um, about one or two in the morning and I'd had far too much wine to drink and um, and I woke up on Friday and I was just not in the mood for anything so I thought to myself right I'm going to see if I can get AI to help me code this thing that I was trying to build um, and it took me about half a day going back and backwards and forwards with it um, multiple iterations and um, getting it to debug itself and I ended up with a script which I ran um, as part of the project for a client that I was working on um, and it worked beautifully and, and it was a really, <clears throat> really nicely written piece of code. So, but AI is not going to take over the world. Yeah. Um, but that's probably, we've now jumped from September the 11th to AI. So let's just, well, uh, well, 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 I, I, to, just I'm, before, I'm, just before, let's see if this works out. I take it. It's this. Yeah. Jeff. Yeah, that's is it, yeah. Okay. Well, this looks like an interesting one. Um, I also mentioned that Corey Hughes' book is uh, out. Uh, you can read uh, the first chapter on newspace.com, uh, and he looks deep into uh, this, of course. I mean, completely and utterly enthralling and I I intriguing um, look at that. Like, the, the word, the, the, that conspiracy it is one of the ones that's really fueled the modern day truth movement the the yeah. idea of conspiracy theory all of it has really been uh was catal catalyzed in that moment um but they've been has... i mean they've been using the same playbook if you if you yeah. look at the techniques over the years they're so boring the c i'm i'm going to say this officially to the cia boring Boring, 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 boring. Don't, boring. don't, don't, don't make him do anything too, uh, too exciting. No, I, but... to be honest, I'm very suspicious about them. <laughs> those people, those free letter people, and I've had enough of them to be perfectly honest. So, I'd, my message to him is just stop, will you? Just yeah, please don't stop. stop. That's it. Just but stop. It's, the thing is that once you see this, is why I find it so difficult that um, even people who are more aware of this stuff instead of the kind of sleeping masses um it's uh yeah i i just you see the same playbooks and the thing that got me it was actually when when the whole rona started and when they started accusing people of being anti-vaxxers and they started really clamping down on people you know what it reminded me of it reminded me of the um the anti uh the the pro-israel people during 9 11 because there was all sorts of threads there are as you know there are all sorts of different threads that come out of 9 11 and there's mm -hmm. quite a few of them like dancing israelis which you look at and you it's a kind of hmm things that make you go hmm mm -hmm. and 
there could Barack nearly straight as soon as it happened coming out and saying, yes, this was done by Osama bin Laden, bloody, bloody. <laughs> yeah, and, and, no, and Bibi, Bibi Netanyahu saying, Oh, this is going to be really good for Israel. Oh, yeah, no, it's really bad for America. Sorry, really, really bad, really tragic, really, really bad. Um, Terrible. And and there's too much. You, this is, but I was trying to wake people up after 9 11. The number of people that I tried to have conversations with, and to this mm-hmm. day, they are still locked into the official narrative, and they're the ones getting jabbed. Mm-hmm. Despite me saying, "Look, I don't trust this. I've, I'm, I, I'm not doing it. No, I and." And it was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I came out of it a lot, lot better than a lot of people I know. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people whose, whose lives have been pretty much destroyed by it. Not, not counting the ones who trustingly took the thing and ended up with all sorts of bad things. Um, and my heart goes out to every single one of those more than, more than anyone else, because they're the ones that thought they were doing the right thing and got shafted for it and now are being completely ignored. Um, yeah, and it's one of the one of the things I will always do on Twitter is I will always try and amplify any any voices of those who have been injured. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just stings it's really of stings of nine eleven firefighters and or every Absolutely. single like sort of heroic moment that where they step up in the face of adversity and it turns out it's a major psyop. And yeah. it's it's all it's all they're just going to be used a little pawn, a public pawn in the face, and uh... and even even people who even this and there's so many going right the way. If we're talking about JFK, going right the way back to the Kennedy assassination, um, people like Mary Pinchot Meyer, who was um, uh, she was the wife of Cord Meyer, who was heavily involved. With, he was in the CIA. Oh, yeah, and so his his important. circle, yeah, and so I mean his circle included people like James Jesus Angleton, and um, I'd love to look more into Cord Meyer. Sorry, I just said uh, well, when you it's, mentioned his name, that, just that his, one, he, he's extraordinary. He's extraordinary. Mary Mary Meyer. There's a really there's an interesting book. Um, it's called Mary's Mosaic about Mary Meyer because she was actually found dead on a towpath in Washington. Um. As which and she she basically she had a diary. She was one of um, Kennedy's mistresses. Is is a towpath a little bit smaller than a footpath? Well, no, it's along a canal. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah, you know, yeah, back yeah. in the I, day where they, I just they like had... the idea toe and foot. That's all. Anyway, <laughs> right? Sorry, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, is yeah, that, it's that Welsh humour coming out again. Yeah, yeah she's. Yeah. I mean, she's a fascinating character. I'd be really interested to see it, it, anything because she's connected into that that whole level of the CIA, which was involved in what happened, and she, being Kennedy's mistress, reportedly never believed the official explanation, and through her contacts was able to gather plenty of information um and find things out and and yeah she was she was taken out it was classic yeah that's dangerous as hell i mean back then yeah. uh, pre pre probably i i would say probably about pre millennium i think after the millennium they really cooled down on their assassinations you know they started to just like spies started to call each other out and i think they realized warfare was changing because of the online world so it's no longer yeah. going to be you can destroy someone and their credibility if you're in control of the media too. And that wasn't the same. They didn't have the same kind of control back then. So, so, I mean, it's just such a different world. And it, yeah. Yeah. The spies media so wasn't different. so concentrated either. I mean, certainly if you look back in the sixties, the amount of independence, certainly in the United States, I mean, not so much in the UK, um, but in the US, there was a lot of uh, independent TV stations and radio stations and mm. newspapers. And over the years, it's been consolidate- consolidated down into fewer and fewer. So actually, I think it might have been, I think it might have been you. I listened to a podcast of yours where you were talking about the Gutenberg Press. Was that, did you do? Does that sound like something that you've talked about? I, I've i once or twice mentioned the Gutenberg Press, but it depends what it's about. Probably. Well, well, no, in the context of, of information, how they when when the Gutenberg first came out with his press and suddenly um, the printed word was no longer just the domain of 
monks and learned people um mm -hmm. suddenly everybody was you had the christian reformation and you have yeah. all of this Pindle. stuff that happens as a result of um the printing press and now if we fast forward that to the internet coming out it was the same process the same thing happened where initially everybody's got a web page and everybody can find yeah. everybody else and there's yeah. no there, there was no there was no google there was no gatekeepers there was no algorithms there was no shadow banning or anything like that everybody had an equal voice everybody had um, their balls or clearly yeah. on display <laughs> absolutely and then and then everybody's um and then over the years we were all funneled into these platforms to the point where now there are people that think that facebook is the internet because it comes on their phone and it's their it's their first gateway into the internet and so they face they think facebook is the internet it actually reminds me of a really funny um this this happened probably about 15 years ago and with clients and and also friends and people i try and be helpful technically because there's a lot of people out there that don't like the technology don't understand it they're forced to use it and they just i just they don't want to do it um and so i offer to help and i do that particularly with clients even if it's not necessarily related to whatever we're working on um and one of the we, we just had this meeting in the office it was a prospective client and we were just getting friendly um and we'd had this we had this big screen and we were looking at web pages and prospective designs for their site and stuff like that and at the end of the meeting he said ed i hope you don't mind but i'd like to ask you a technical question um what's the difference between firefox and the internet and i was like because he's talking about when he says the internet he means internet explorer which is the default browser that you that he had on his system Mm -hmm. And it's one of those moments where I don't want to burst out laughing. And, and I'm just, I just kind of smile and gave him a, oh, it's just a different web browser. They're just different ways of accessing the internet. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it, it's that, yeah, it, it, it's that sort of just people funny don't, story. You people don't have the ability yet to understand that we're, <laughs> or, or the, 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 now that's happening again so we what you're talking about i have talked about um like especially w within uh religion the the sort of like ability to have access to bibles all of a sudden and tyndall writing the bible and then going out and and being able to press it and and smuggle it into the country and around to different people and suddenly they're not having to rely on uh someone who only speaks latin to tell them what's in a book you know it's you you've got you've got access to these things yourself it changes everything and when the internet come around changed everything again the access again people have access to this information and that was powerful man i i mean it's really it's kind of like this personal journey isn't it the internet for us who lived when it was just uh is, is like dial-up modems you'd oh, yeah, no, get I remember the those. slowest internet around if you want to download a song it's probably going to take you all day but still these new things were going boom 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 they were all coming up peer-to-peer -peer platforms um different ways to browse the internet uh archiving internet pages things that, that that suddenly like you know they knew where it was going very early on and we were just passengers on that ride and for me like the start of the internet was just astounding it was just so exciting but you couldn't work out what you'd type into it now it just seems like a constant flow of typing things in you're constantly like the next thing the next thing the next thing back at the yeah. start it was like oh you can ask this thing anything Shh, what do you possibly ask it and you're probably going to end up going down um the realm of conspiracy theory because it was so interesting um all of these things were so interesting so so when was um on on to to like 9 11 i mean i for me i was put i I remember what, when you were talking earlier on, I remember one person I worked with. I'll say his first name, Chris. He was a lovely boy. Bless him. Um, he was, when 9-11 happened, I about a, literally on a year anniversary of 9-11, I started working in uh, Dixon's Excel 
it was like a big uh, electronics retailer and uh there was this guy who worked there chris who had started studying into 9 11 and within a couple of months he was sending me some crazy messages he had just like early on right at the start of the internet probably about 2003 2000 late 2002 early 2003 he had gone off the edge of the conspiracy wormhole before there was any like net of information you just like like, go down there back then and it was everything goes so when you're talking about like this was wild west internet you know mm. um and well, a little break stuff. i've made a cup of tea i used to work with a guy in dixon's xl i've tried to tell his story a few times already but the computers keep crashing and the internet keeps going down so i should tell it as quickly as i can just in case they don't like me telling it i knew a guy called chris he was a nice guy you know worked in dixon's it was a technology company and he got into conspiracies around 2003, 2004, surrounding 9-11 and went down rabbit hole so deep that he came out the other side um, as a madman. And and basically later on, I saw him after not seeing him for a while because he was a bit of a madman. And he was like, yeah, I had to go through that. I had to come out the other side. And I think we all went through some sort of state of like distress. We're leaving the comfort zone here and we're entering into somewhere else and it's somewhere really spicy. So I take it you, where was the point where you said, no way, this is obviously I'm on this side of the fence. Um when those two towers came down that that for, <laughs> that that for me was the before and after moment in terms of what you described your friend going through um there's a very good book that i came across around about the, the exact time i needed to read it which was robert anton wilson's P prometheus rising and anybody out there who is just getting started in this whole conspiracy wonderland needs to investigate we needs to read prometheus rising and in that book um wilson describes it as chapel perilous is that place that you enter when you start down the conspiracy rabbit hole and in chapel perilous up is down black is white nothing makes sense you have to look at everything five different ways and sometimes you can look at it from five different ways and you see five different completely different stories People that you thought you could trust, you can't trust. People that you did, don't think you can trust, you can trust. And he said that you come out of chap Chapel Perilous either completely agnostic or completely insane. And that you have to always maintain a grip on your own sense of self, your own sanity, mm. your own... Um, you, you have to have anchors into... in, yeah, in not, yeah. not into normality because... You, re you soon realize that what you thought was the normal world is just a massive construct. It's like being in a bloody matrix. Um, and it, it's it's crazy how these things work out because people talk about predictive programming and then the matrix came out in the late 90s. And it was one of those films that didn't do very well at the box office but did brilliantly on DVD. It and did I, I, it did brilliantly on being sold out of a locker in work on VHS, mm. grainy VHS. That's what I, I tell you. I can probably and, and I mean, I watched that film three times back to back the first time and I, I just watched it and I was just blown away by every aspect of not the, I mean, the film itself was good, but it was the, it was the story behind the film and the, and the, the it was like, it resonated like Big Ben going off next to my bedroom window um and you just it, it's i think stuff like that actually prepared me for what happened on 9 11 um and also being really into construction videos there's this there's this old series on discovery of this company that goes around the world taking down really difficult buildings and the amount of effort that they have to put into getting a building to go boom straight down yeah now, it's insane I mean, one of my recent in the last, it's interesting thing about 9-11, just following on from that a bit, little bit, because this is relevant, is um, that even after 20 years, I'm still coming across really interesting new pieces of information about 9-11, which previously I would have ignored. It's like I, I sort of skirted around the directed energy weapons thing 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I was researching 9-11.
And it just seemed a bit too fantastical to me. And there was some, it was too much like sci-fi, too, a little bit too kooky, even for me. But ever since the big Rona, from my perspective, all bets are off as far as all of those theories. And that includes David Icke and, and, and the reptilians and all of that stuff. There's a few things that I'm, I haven't been sold on. Okay, if you if you, if you don't, I, I I'm coming to terms with the fact that if you don't have all options on the table, uh, however much you, you think lacking a probability, then you're not just not doing it right. We got a straw man and strong man everything. We got to go through everything one by one because obviously we're only getting little bits of it, and we shouldn't just be happy with a little bit. And this is what the problem I have with the other side of censorship. What we're doing is sorting through what needs to be sorted through. Mm. Absolutely. And I mean, my, my thing with the scent, that was another, the, the, I mean, more recently, that's one of the big red flags for me was all the censorship. Um, because I, I'm a, I'm a child of the end of the cold war. I remember, as I said before, I remember watching the Berlin wall coming down and, and there was that scorpions concert. They did, um, uh, winds of change. And to this day, if when when the Scorpions when that song comes on, or I even think about it, I'll start choking up, and it's it's one of the fastest ways to to have tears streaming down my face because that song, that moment, the the hope. It was also because I mean I was late teens as well, so it was um, mm -hmm. there was this. It, oh my God! It's the end of the Cold War. Peace is broken out. All of the 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 Iron Curtains going down. All of these. Eastern and, and Western Euro European, because people have to remember that up until the late, uh, the early 90s, um, there were people in East and West Germany, families who'd been split by the Cold War. And forgive me, it chokes me up just thinking about it now. It really does. It, it's one of those pivotal moments. And then you see afterwards what happens and and it has repercussions to this day because i remember all of the 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 reagan and gorbachev meeting and the breakup of the soviet union and all of this other stuff that was happening and the the um assurances that were given to the soviets about nato going west and the amount of um difficulty they had trying to reunify East and West Germany because the, the Soviets were completely petrified that it was going to end up being um, that they'd end up just having hostile forces on their borders which is a legitimate concern as a country especially a country that's had especially two when you look at it now <laughs> yeah well especially when you look at history as well because it's not just it, it's not just a country it's a country that's had two massive giant armies intent on taking over and has credit to them seen them both off um and i mean people don't give the russians enough credit for world war ii because yeah people they, like to think oh amazing. we won world war ii no we didn't it was it was the russians who died at stalingrad the the west who could uh, could only get their balls out eventually because of the the massive enormous kahuna uh, kahunas on these guys over there who were moving Absolutely. like uh, uh, completely across the land just taking territory after the biggest standoff in history you know just uh, amazing yeah I, i've got so much i got loads of times for uh, for time for Russian culture, Russian people. Uh, I got so, so much time uh, for them. I think they're really, really like uh, they're I mean, Solzhenitsyn, Tchaikovsky, Dostoevsky. I mean, you can't to to say that it's like well, something that makes me very angry about um, the neocons, people like Victoria Newland and Jake Sullivan and people like that. Is is this view that they have of Russia just being a a, a, a big petrol station? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, masquerading as a country, and I, I mean, I, I get called a Putin troll all the time on Twitter because <laughs> I, I refuse to simply pick a side because everyone's telling me that I have to pick a side. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for me, this is because I'm half English and half Dutch, and the minute that as a guy, someone finds another guy finds that out, oh, which football team do you support if England play Holland? I don't watch football news. <laughs> <laughs>
don't do it. And I couldn't pick. I mean, asking me to asking me to say what what do you prefer, England or Holland? And I'll just re- I'll probably retort with 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 some sort of diatribe about the fact that all of this nationalistic bollocks is just completely pointless and destroying the world. But it's base level. Those type of um, uh, people trying to get people to make that sort of like statement is trying to coax them in to divisive rhetoric, knowing that it's divisive. I mean, that's what that's what it is. And it's such a, a really like if you can say that to someone who's doing it at the time, they never do it again. And I think this is one of the things we've we've had all of the tools of just being able to say what somebody's doing taken away from us, and instead we're just looking at what they're doing rather than the reasons they're doing it like what's actually yeah but behind... people are constantly reacting as well because mm-hmm. well, the other the because, well the system is trying to keep us off guard they're trying to keep us off balance so not off guard on guard and off balance and they're always always trying to figure out what's what's true and what isn't um and the yeah you see things like the bbc and all of these people who supposedly are trustworthy and say they're trustworthy the bbc spends an awful lot of time trying to convince everyone that they're trustworthy mm-hmm. and believable um and with the, and <laughs> when you get to the censorship this is where i started with the whole berlin wall thing that that censorship as soon as you someone's being censored i automatically want to find out what they've got to say yeah i know i know it's just oh it's so tempting isn't it and and to think that the the world that I thought we were moving out of when the Berlin Wall came down actually seems to be, it seems to be going almost full circle and we seem to be on the wrong side of the bloody wall this time. Mm, And this is, Um, yeah, this is something very, something I've been really pushing at recently is that we, we have found ourselves, it used to be like, this cultural revolution over there in Russia was the thing that was a problem, but this cultural revolution over here in the West has become a problem for everybody, including the Russians. So, I mean, I, we are, we are, we, we have become the same as the Soviet Union was um, split apart, uh, rife for, for um, falling apart, an empire mm-hmm. falling apart, an empire yeah. falling apart. Well, it is it. I mean, we, we are, we are watching this civilizational change and the the shift in power and i'm not i'm not convinced about the bricks but i will say that i like the idea of a multipolar world much more than a unipolar world and i yeah, think agreed. that um i don't necessarily i i, I have trust issues generally <laughs> certainly certainly from the for the last 3 years um, in terms of what what I'm hearing from official people, whether that's Putin or Biden or Xi or Sunak or whoever, um, I suspect that they're not giving us the whole truth. But when you when you see what they've when you look at what they do instead of what they say, and on the one side you have these um, arrogant, fake smiling Western leaders like Sunak, who want to try and think he's everybody's friend and he's doing everything for everybody and he's working to sort the country out. Same with Starmer. And at the same time, they, their actions undermine their words all the time and they just yeah. work on narrative. And the country's falling to bits. They can't fix the roads. There's constant shortages in supermarkets. Inflation's going through the roof. The, the healthcare system is basically non-existent now. Mm-hmm. And then you look at somewhere like Russia, where the economy is basically booming. The sanctions have been completely have completely backfired, and they're only hurting us. Mm-hmm. Um, and with, and the, 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 I just heard that the Germans are buying Russian liquefied natural gas, which they could yeah. be having much more cheaply through the pipeline that was blown up. Oh. And, and and it's just, but it's when you actually look at all of these different things, they're like links in a chain. And that chain stretches right the way back to the JFK assassination, further back than that, just goes on and on. And and these there's events that are that are links in this chain. What well, one of the one of the one of those events we we're going to speak about is um, uh, 
after the 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 British version of nine eleven, you know, the seven yeah. seven bombing. And um, I, I know you know some things about that. And I, I, you know, for me, I like discussing these things out loud because I don't think they've been discussed enough, um, especially like people's experiences. Trying to understand what what people went through, like, uh, is is really hard. And I think it was a, it's like like the nine eleven attacks was a collective hit on America or perceived as that. That's how the seven seven bombings were pushed in the UK. And I remember that I uh, had moved out to France uh, two three days before. Um, I had been on the underground, you know, I, I arrived in another country. I was about to start living in another country for the first time. And then these bombings happened and, and it was just like, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. I was just, even though I knew that there was probably a load of, this was probably an operation happening deep down. I know this, I, I know this to be so it's obvious. It doesn't taste right. It doesn't smell right. Nine eleven. we've already seen what's happening there. It became fascinating to see how they display the drama to us and that became uh what i remember of it being very like feeling distant but feeling like it was something that was a really important part to what the story that they were creating of being british um so what was going on there what what was happening at the time that you can bring light on to um well it's not seven seven is a really interesting one because i was properly deep into my research by that point, I'd I'd started on 9-11 and I'd gone back to Kennedy and I'd retraced older events and, and the internet was actually a much more useful resource then, than it is now because of the lack of Google trying to tell you what to bloody think. Um, and I remember 7-7 happening. I was actually living in the same place, doing the same job. My life in external terms, wasn't significantly different from how it is now, apart from wrinkles and more flab um, and life experiences. But I was very tuned in um, and I was actually updating a blog at the time. And it was kind of, um, there was also sources like Prison Planet, which was Paul Joseph Watson, who's now, He's more kind of a YouTube commentator, but back then he was much more um, connected to Alex Jones and the conspiracy side of things and stuff like that. And he, I mean, he's a fantastic researcher back in the day. And I, I mean, a lot of his videos now are, are funny, um, but yeah, anyway, so there's, there's a whole lot of stuff that he covered at the time. And it was because of 9-11 i was suspicious about 7-7 as soon as it happened and as soon as those first there was first the first reports of bombs going off in london happened i was all over the news and then came came along peter power um and uh, visor consultants who happened to be carrying out an exercise basically doing exactly what ended up happening mm -hmm. and somehow this guy was let onto local radio and it, it's the thing one of the common features of these big mass casualty events like 9-11 and 7-7 is that at the very very beginning within the with in the first two or three hours is when most of the pertinent information actually comes out mm -hmm. in little bits but it's then you'll you, it'll be on an, on one news report and you never see it again um, and this this Peter Power thing that that was very much what they tried to do with that, but by that point we were just at the point where it was really quite easy to video stuff, and someone managed to get a copy of that footage. Um, and it's it's still I mean it's still available. People can go and find it on YouTube. And because of the FEMA drills in nine eleven the day before, uh, on on the the 10th of september um the i was just looking for stuff and if you think about the climate back then this was just before the iraq war as well um and the the, the whole country here was against i mean it was the biggest one of the biggest anti-war marches that has ever happened in london um and 
it, it was basically the government completely ignored it and went along with with Bush um, in that disastrous now, as we know now know, illegal war. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was all bound up with that. They had to, they needed to keep the terrorism fear going. Mm-hmm. That was part of it. They had to link the UK with the US. There was also the Atocha train bombing in Spain, which again, it connected mainland Europe into the whole terrorism thing. They followed very, they were very similar sorts of scripts. And I mean, there there was so much about 7-7 itself, which didn't make sense from the supposed bombers through interesting reports from various eyewitnesses who I remember hearing about at the time who were saying that they were having to walk out of train carriages that had um, where the metal shark, the, 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 the metal of the, f- the floor of the train carriage was actually pointed upwards as if there'd been an explosion from underneath. Mm-hmm. Um, reports of um, people working on the buses that, that, that the, there were anonymous reports from bus drivers saying that the crew that normally worked on the CCTV systems on the buses um, there was a different crew that came um, and that they spent longer working on those buses than than they would normally have spent on a bus. And, oh, yeah, the CCTV on that bus was ha- happened to be one of the few bus CCTV systems that wasn't working in the whole capital, which, I mean, that is... But when, whenever... It's, it's amazing how we can be completely covered in CCTV and any time you actually need the bloody cameras, they're never working. It's the same with during um, Diana's crash that the only CCTV cameras that weren't working in Paris on that day were the ones lining the bloody route of the... Yeah. I find it quite sweet. I find it quite sweet that they leave so many breadcrumbs for us to find because, I mean, that that sort of stuff can be discounted by a lot of people, but some people will follow the next to the next breadcrumb. Um, and with... Uh, it was seven seven. The whole the want to create that feeling of of uh, impending doom. They were really good at it. They created it, but I was aware at the time that oh, you know, even though it's been created, they've created the thing that they're trying to scare us with. So a lot of these people may actually believe they're doing it for the same purpose that they want us to believe they're doing it. And so then it's really hard to work out who to have sympathy for or not, because they're both doing the thing. The one person, both, both things are true. You know, there's a conspiracy to, to do a load of events to force policy elsewhere and force wars upon us. And then uh, there's someone who believes in what they're doing, doing something for God and for something else. You know, there's two things are true simultaneously it becomes so very confusing, but would, the, uh, do you know anything about the bombers who were involved in Seven Seven? Were they? They were. They were basically just regular people. And my yeah. my suspicion about them is that they actually they were family men. There was one of them that had a new new baby. None of them, uh, none of their friends reported any kind of extremist tendencies or anything like that. Um, and my my pet theory is that they were actually part of the exercise. Mm-hmm. That they were basically hired as um, Muslim-looking dudes, upstanding British citizens. Hey, guys, um, do you want to earn, earn some extra cash? I mean, like I said, one of the guys had a new family, for example. Mm-hmm. And if you're a, if you're a new dad and and you and you see an ad in the paper or or maybe some local, maybe they're advertised in some, I don't know, a few chip shops somewhere in. Uh, uh, an, an area that has lots of Asians saying, I want to earn an extra bit of cash. Call this number. We need some volunteers to help us with a, mm-hmm. with a, um, uh, a homeland security exercise. Now that's what the Americans would say, uh, mm-hmm. a home, a home office, whatever, but they could have. Yeah. And, and so those guys, 
just ba- essentially did what they were told. They were given rucksacks, which always, for suicide bombers, um, especially if you're going to be on a a packed commuter train in the morning rush hour on the London Underground, um, and you're carrying a bomb around in a rucksack, why wouldn't you have a a vest on, for example? Because mm-hmm. you've got, apart from anything else, you've got much more risk that someone is accident, accidentally going to bash it or something like that, mm-hmm. and you end up uh, accidentally going off. Now, I mean, obviously... Suicide bombers don't have to have suicide vests. That's we don't want to be a complete cliche about the yeah, whole yeah. thing. But there was something about that that I always found a bit odd. Um, there was lots lots of things about it that I found really odd. The way that the bus route had been changed, um, mm-hmm. the, the 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 guy that was on the bus, his whole behaviour was really odd for someone that was actually trying to because he he sat. He didn't go and sit in the bus in in the most crowded part of the bus as if he was a a genuine terrorist bomber wanting to um uh wanting to blow things up and kill people to make a religious statement um he was actually in the least crowded part of the bus as far away from everybody else as he could get mm-hmm. without without not being on the bus so there's a, there's a chance that they didn't know that they were carrying anything explosive at all. I'm not convinced they did. I'm not, I I'm I mean, and obviously all of this is speculation. I don't want to disrespect any of the people who died or any of the families mm, or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, this yeah. is not about. Um, I think I, I think searching for the truth and examining all our angles is is fair fair to do. And that I I hope that however emotional I feel, if the same thing happens to me or my loved ones, that people will do the same. You know, that would be nice. I would like to think so, but not everybody does. I remember um, probably about three or four months after it had all happened, having um, a a fam well not my family but my exes um, a, a late girlfriend's um, family. She basically we had a birthday party for someone. I think it was her mum, and one of her, her and her step brother's partner had been caught up. She'd been on one of the tube trains and had to walk out of the underground and me, me being me at the time and being much um, less talented at restraining myself. Um, oh, I started going off on a spiel about how it was all a big conspiracy theory and stuff. And the look on her face, I, I learned a valuable lesson that day about mm. decorum and when to say things about conspiracy theories and when not mm. to. Which is why, when particularly when I'm covering stuff like this, I I think it's important to recognise that people died and people's lives were changed. And it, it, my my search, as you said quite rightly, my search for the truth is about trying to trying to give their deaths a reason and a meaning. That's that that so that they didn't die for nothing. If they if they died for a lie and they died for um, a war. I think that if you if they was if you could ask them in the afterlife whether they would be happy having their deaths used to start a war which killed hundreds of thousands of people, or whether they would want that they would want their the truth to be exposed despite the fact that it might upset their family. I think um, when you put when you put the question in that sort of way, it. I think it's it's right to explore the truth. Uh, yeah, I just think I it's important to do it respectfully as well. I I, I hope that that I, I think I think that that if you ask anyone in the afterlife, they're likely to say forgive everything. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but I, I, we we are in a place where we don't know what comes beyond, but we also know we need to keep the rule of law here, and so there is um a lot of these actions are taken because there's some people who think this is the best way to keep the rule of law, scaring people, coercing people, manipulating people, sacrificing people um, for some higher cause. And then in doing that, you save more 
lives over here that you can't completely prove that you have actually saved anybody you could have just killed a load of people which is is uh tends to be a reoccurring theme in mm. all of these um uh, uh, machinations i think it, they, they are like you know it, it's it's often you're entering into i can't even imagine what these meetings go like you know, well, what are we doing today? Well, we're organizing some bombings in a few months. All right. And um, what, what we meant to do, I, I don't know. We got, we got to get these Muslims to, to, to look like they're, they're bombers. Well, that will be, I'll give them a backpack and some money and they'll be in there because people are desperate anyway. So, I mean, the, the whole thing is, it's really hard to work out how you'd even start it off, but it, it's not it's, as simple as I've said. Go on. It's very dark. It, it's the kind of, um, the kind of mentality, the kind of personality that can um, that can do that kind of thing and can manipulate that many people and can stand by and watch that kind of thing happen. Because even if we forget all the conspiracy stuff and we say that those those guys did, they didn't do it on their own. Mm. There's always there's and to 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 denigrate us as conspiracy theorists when pretty much every significant event in human history was down to a conspiracy of some kind. I mean, even if it's just a conspiracy between George Bush and Tony Blair to make sure that they got both their countries to go along with their invasion. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the well-known conspiracies about, um, uh, what was it, that Catherine Gunn, um, where she there was a, an NSA memo asking for information about Security Council members. Um, and stuff that could be used to to manip well to strong arm them into going along with the with the resolutions that they needed to go along with to make the war happen, mm -hmm. and she leaked that. And I mean, one of the there's a great film, um, Official Secrets, with Kira Knightley mm. about Catherine Gunn. All right, and that kind of the sort of bravery that it takes. To, and that, but then you also you, you look at things like that and you think, oh, was it a conspiracy rabbit hole? But then they ended up trying to do it for the official secrets. And it was because of the legal team that she had and the way that they'd crafted her defense, mm. which was absolute genius just for the record in terms of, of lawyering. Um, and the mm. government basically had to had to withdraw the the thing and, and because they couldn't. And it was... Um, things like that there's a, there's a few times that happens where mm. someone is brave enough i mean ed snowden as well mm. i'm i'm 50 50 on ed snowden i i i i feel that it was there was an operation there that um they were to uh, that information was coming out anyway um and if they are in control of how it comes out they can also create the antithesis and uh, Greenwald, oh, it's suspicious. All of this, all of it, all of it. The way they've like switched allegiances. I think, like lots of people I talk to, seem to assume that they must have compromise on some of these people, and that when you look at their lives, it's like always easy to compromise them. But I, everyone I just... could be compromised. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And I do accept. I do accept that as both um, a warning and criticism uh, of going too far. I do try and walk a line. So, like I say, I say I'm fifty fifty. I'm willing to turn around and say, personally, I think he, he, a Snowden was a bit of a construct. I believe Greenwald is one of those who are like allowed to be semi-establishment whistleblower sort of journalists. I find the same with Matt Taibbi and other people like that on that that sort of scene, uh, Aaron Maté. And I know loads of people are like, oh, they're independent and they're really important. But then you look at what they do and they, they kind of like, it is a very, like, I call it the neo-establishment underneath. But uh, again, I... I, I mean, I, well I, to be honest, well. I try and take the stuff that, the information that they produce on face value and I look at it yeah, myself that's, to that's, see if that makes sense and in some cases important. like i mean matt taibbi um he he gets some some gold stars from me just for coming up with the uh, goldman sachs is a um a vampire squid on the face of humanity 
and I mean his research. Easy one, no easy one. Oh no, it's an easy one. It's just a nice, nice turn of phrase. Yeah. But I mean, he did some fan, some of the some of his work during the financial crisis. There was a lot of stuff that I read by him, where he actually helped me understand some mm. of the some of the shenanigans that were going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I agree with Ryan Christian from Last American Vagabond about um, the Twitter files, how it's all just been screenshots and snippets, and but this, they've they've claimed, they've said that they're going to release actual stuff, and it doesn't happen, and it just seems a bit like a some sort of musk musk musky sort of psyop type thing. His hegemony there, um, Taibi's dad has also got links to this like underbelly establishment and his co uh the person he worked with on the exile in russia i can't remember his name i can never remember his name he's so annoying um oh it's always on the tip of my tongue it's one of those um they, they wrote a book together i think it's called the exile something 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 um it's a very racy book where matt taibbi says lots of naughty things and so does his um co-author uh, and co-guy for the exile um but he said um it's amos i think his last name may be amos anyway um he, he said that basically uh taibi knows he's going to follow in the footsteps of his father and enter into establishment stuff and i started looking into taibi and then it was like you know I wasn't long before I was coming across him praising CFR members and other people who was like, oh, they're all running this circle. Yes. And then when they outed the Hamilton 68 stuff and the stuff of the Twitter files, well, that's an information dump. That's what the intelligence agencies do. They finish that project, so they just info dump out all of the information, and everybody goes, oh, now we know everything. Let's move on. And it's actually, there's a whole layer of reasons why they were using that stuff to do whatever and people are just they see the information dump and just go oh, at solve problem solve we have all the information but they haven't come to the conclusion of what that information means and what the information you're still not being showed means and i feel that taibi is one who is uh walking in the same share like walking along with people who are doing the same job as he's doing in different areas mm. and so all of these people they pump out the same people it's the same people that, that someone like russell brand would have on his guests a lot of the people who russell brand would have on his guests people are like oh yes i agree with them i agree with them and i agree with them i agree with them but then i look into them and i go Mm, I'm a bit worried about who they are and what it really means. Um, because a lot of th this, the, what you're given, if you're listening to someone, it's probably because you've been tricked into listening to someone. <laughs> that mm. tends to be the good yeah. rule of thumb nowadays. So these characters who are like the establishment says, this really important person like Seymour Hirsch has this to say about uh, what happened at Nord Stream. Everybody goes, yeah, okay. I'm going to believe everything he says. Yes, I heard. So now Aaron Maté starts writing articles. Taibi starts saying things. All these different people see more Hirsch, see more Hirsch, see more Hirsch. Mm. And the same tentacles of this octopus, a different type of octopus than the one Taibi was talking about with Goldman Sachs, is uh, is out there doing the same sort of like uh, sucky stuff that sucks. Right at the end. We've had a chat about a load of different stuff. We were going to talk about some subjects in particular, but I had a feeling... No, we, well, we covered happen. what we were going to talk about because we, we'd started yeah. um, on the 7-7 seven, seven, and we did. it did take us about an hour to get there, but I, I feel like mm -hmm. it was an, it was an mm -hmm. interesting hour as well of yeah, just, yeah. just covering lots of different bases. The thing is that it's not until you start doing that a little bit that you actually begin to start to see how things are connected together. If you spend too much time down one single rabbit hole, you forget all of the other ones. And it's it's a bit like a frog hopping from lily pads, hopping between lily pads on a pond kind of thing. It's a nice way of putting it. But it's you you have to you have to skip around a bit because all these things are connected. There's no um Certainly big events, 7-7 seven, seven bombings, 9-11, invasion of Iraq, um, COVID, etc. It's all, they're all, they're all links in a chain, like I was saying.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, big big moments in uh, a, a massive mm. chain that is all over the place. And once you realize how things work, uh, you start to see how it can all be manufactured to be the way it is. Um, and and that's I, I mean, what what's your uh, what's going to be your aim for the future? Then are you going to keep on the meme front? Um, I suppose you're talking about like working within like doing AI stuff now. So I suppose that's going to be all of the 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 rage, um, and that'll take off. Where do we you see us going in the near future with that? Um, well, well, as far as the AI goes, I think it's going to integrate the same way other technologies have the only problem is that the other side can use it for much more nefarious facial scanning control stuff so that's where the memes come in because i just hope that some of the memes that i put out get seen by people who are just germinating questions and just starting to say hang on a minute are these people really serious um and in between the memes, hopefully they'll see some of my other tweets and connect with some of the people that I'm connected with on places like Twitter. Um, Because it's not just me, there's a whole movement of people who don't get the the sort of recognition, not recognition, but don't have the same sort of follower base that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do what I can to try and amplify them if I can vaccine injured people particularly other memers are good if if there are memers out there who aren't following me and yeah go for it because um the memes they keep me going as well it's also it's art therapy i I joke about that sometimes Mm. and and say look this isn't this isn't art it's therapy and it's Mm. like it's like an abused kid drawing pictures of their abuser that's what i do when i'm I'm, when I'm mucking around with pictures and it's also just having a laugh. I mean, one of the nicest comments I get from people is I was having a really bad day and I've just come across one of your memes and you've just got me in stitches and I've just had a look at your account and I'm still laughing and you've made my day better. Mm -hmm. I love that. If you can make one person's day, if everybody set out to make one other person's day a little bit better spontaneously, without expecting anything, without being asked, Mm -hmm. just go out and try and make one person's day a little bit better. If we all did that, the world would bloody change overnight. Yeah, that's an awesome message. And I have to say, George Bush painting the second explosion on the towers is one of the best memes. (laughs) It's still my favorite. It's it's actually one of my (laughs) first ones. Oh, really? Um, yeah, and I, I it's, it's one I of I can the... hear Bob Ross. I did the meme of it. I did the, the caption for it. Uh, and uh, just going to paint this one a little friend. You know, that's <laughs> just, oh, oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's terrible. But it, um, sometimes it, it, you can capture a moment and uh, you can capture an entire, entire decade or an entire paradigm shift just by a simple little image. And, mm-hmm. I, I never I never set out to, to actually create something like that when I made that meme. I was just combining pictures. But when it when I did it, I was like, oh, that's good. And it's yeah. it's not, yeah, sometimes you've got to give yourself a bit of credit too. It's a good thing. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Hey, thanks for coming Thank on you. and talking. Thanks for talking. So much fun. I'm always happy to come back and chew the fat with you, amigo. Rock in. Excellent fun.